Hello and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective, and today we're looking at chapters 60, 61, 62 and 63 of The Da Vinci Code. Before we get into it, I just want to point to the fact that The Maze Runner is almost finished over on Patreon. This week, I'm dropping the last couple of chapters. And then next week, I'll be looking at the movie and also some spoilers for the rest of the trilogy because I've decided that I never want to read another single sentence of The Maze Runner and its associated books ever again. So I'm just going to read the Wikipedia, see what happens. (laughs) So spoilers for that one. Um, And if you're interested, head over to Patreon, patreon.com slash breaking down bad books. And then after that, I will be doing Fifty Shades Freed. So excited to get back into the world of E.L. James. Super pumped for it even though I know I'm going to regret that after like five minutes, but yeah, super, super, super excited to get back into Anna's inner goddess. I don't actually want to get into Anna's inner goddess. I meant more in her world, in the world of the inner goddess. And you know what? If you're interested, go on over to Patreon and have a listen. It's going to be, it's going to be rough stuff. So where we left off with the Da Vinci Code, it was just a lot of info dumping as per usual. <laughs> I mean, you'd think we could have gotten the story of the Holy Grail in like one or two chapters, but this is like the, the 30th consecutive chapter at T-Bing's house, I think. And so they were just telling Sophie, the Holy Grail's a woman. And she's like, what? And then they said, look at the Last Supper. That's a painting of a woman. And she said, what? And then they were like, yeah, she's special. She's the Holy Grail because Holy Grail actually means royal blood. And she's carrying the bloodline of Christ because Christ knocked her up and had babies. And she said, what? <laughs> so, oh, so let's pick up there. Okay. So... She's repeating to herself. She's like, sang real, sang real, san grial, royal blood, holy grail. Oh my God, it all makes sense. <laughs> I really don't think it does. She says it was all intertwined. Um, yeah, all right. All right, we'll go with that. It's all intertwined, sure. So she's standing in the ballroom trying to take this in. She's like, whoa, all disoriented about it. <laughs> and T-Bing says, as you can see, my dear, and he points towards a bookshelf. And he says, Leonardo is not the only one who has been trying to tell the world the truth about the Holy Grail. He says, all these historians have been talking about the royal bloodline for years. And she's like, surely not. And he's pointing out all of these books being like, yep, that's a history of it. That's a history of it. That's a history of it. And yet it's still the biggest secret in the world, but yep, that's a history of it. And T-Bing says, here is perhaps the most best known tome And he points to a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the acclaimed international bestseller. And she's like, a bestseller? I've never fucking heard of it. (laughs) And he's like, well, you were young. Uh, It was from back in the 80s. So, you know, it was a different time back then, Soph. He says, to give them their credit, they finally brought the idea of Christ's bloodline into the mainstream. And yet he doesn't give them credit because he doesn't drop the name of the authors. (laughs) To give them credit, these, these nameless authors should be praised for the work they've done. And she says, well, what was the church's reaction? And he's like, outrage, obviously. He says, outrage, of course. You dumb bitch. (laughs) They're so mean to Sophie. She's trying to process a lot of information. And they're going slowly, obviously, because it's been 30 chapters. But I don't think they're going slow enough for her. And they're really asking her to take on a lot. Whereas, as I've said before, she should be more concerned with who the hell killed a granddad. (laughs) But she's not that worried about that. She's more worried about how the church reacted to a book being written about the sacred feminine and the secret of the Holy Grail. You know, get your priorities sorted, Soph. And I think maybe she could do that if they just gave her a second. No one's given her a second this whole night to just process the fact that a granddad got murdered. And they're expecting her to be all up to date on all of this historical religious bullcrap. Whereas I think she needs a bubble bath and just to relax and think it through. But no, so T-Bing's going on about how the Crusades were all about destroying information. The church has tried to discredit this theory about Mary Magdalene for decades, centuries, millennia. And Langdon's like, it's true, Sophie. The historical evidence supporting this is substantial. Okay, well, well, I'll believe it when I see it. Like, do I think that Jesus might have fucked around with Mary Magdalene? Sure, that's all within the realm of possibility. But do I really also think that a secret group called the Knights Templar have tracked the bloodline of this, this baby that's been squirreled away? For 2000 years, they've been charting a family tree. Like, I don't think so. Like, I, I did that thing where you spit in a tube and you send it off to some lab who now owns your DNA and then they send it back and they say, here are your cousins. And then you look at the family tree and you're like, oh yeah. And it didn't go back that far. Basically some convicts back in England 
got put on a ship to Australia because they stole a sheep or something or other. And that's where it ended. That's as far back as I could get. But apparently I'm led to believe that the Knights Templar or the, whatever they're called, the Priory of Sion, have just been meticulously tracking this bloodline over 2000 years. And, and there's been no mistakes. And also that the bloodline's still going. You're telling me that someone wasn't infertile along the line? Someone didn't die in childbirth? Like, oh, come off it. And so Teabing, he's just saying that it's this big cover up by the church. They could never have survived public knowledge of a bloodline. <laughs> I think they could have. <laughs> Does it really matter? He says that a child of Jesus would undermine the critical notion of Christ's divinity. I mean, who cares? So he knocked someone up. I'm, uh, that doesn't mean that he can't be divine. And so Sophie's looking at one of these books that have, have published the history of this. And she notices the five petal rose emblem thingy. And she's like, oh, look at that. It's a five petal rose. And Teabing's like, oh, good eye, Sophie. He's like, that's the priory symbol for the grail. And he says, because Mary's name was forbidden to be spoken in the church, which, I mean, I grew up in a Catholic school, in a Catholic high school. We heard the name Mary Magdalene a lot. Like, I don't think this cover up is that effective if she's well known and being taught in Catholic high schools. But apparently her name was Forboden. So they started referring to her as a rose. So they gave her this pseudonym. And he says that the rose has its ties to the five pointed pinnacle of Venus and the compass rose. Oh, and by the way, the word rose is identical in English, French, German, and many other languages. So that's where they used it. And then Langdon pipes up and he's like, yeah, and rose is also an anagram of Eros, the Greek god of sexual love. What's that got to do with anything? (laughs) That's not proof. That's not proof. Anagrams don't prove shit. Stop using anagrams as proof for wild theories. And then Teabing says, the rose, which is a proper noun with a capital R, has always been the premier symbol of female sexuality. Has it? Has it? He says, in primitive goddess cults, the five petals represented the five stations of female life, birth, menstruation, motherhood, menopause, and death. Ah, yes. The five stations of female life. I'm sure the women reading this book love having their life broken down into those five key pivotal points. And all the women out there who aren't mothers, I bet you now feel like shit, don't you? Because, oh, it's the five stations of female life. Get fucked. (laughs) Oh, what archaic thinking. And then he says, in modern times, the flowering roses, ties to womanhood, are considered more visual. And then he's like, Robert, do you want to explain? And Robert doesn't say anything. He's like looking awkward. And Teabing's like, oh, you're such a prude. And he says... What Robert is fumbling with is the fact that the blossoming flower resembles the female genitalia. What the, no, no, you were telling me last week that the letter V is actually a womb. And now you're telling me that the rose is, is female genitalia. Now, granted, I couldn't draw you a diagram of female genitalia. It's all a mystery to me, but I know I've seen roses before and I've walked past a rose bush and I didn't say, ah, look, a vagina. No, I didn't. So I'm not going to buy this. I'm not going to cop it. It's bullshit. You can't just say that like it's truth. And then he says the flower is the sublime blossom from which all mankind enters the world. Please don't refer to female genitalia as a sublime blossom. Like it very may well be. Sure. (laughs) Maybe if if women out there want to refer to their genitalia as a sublime blossom, go for it. But creepy old T Bing in his little palace. Nah, -uh. you don't get to talk like that, bud. That's just creepy. And Langdon, he must be feeling awkward as fuck because he's like, yeah, so um, back, back to the history of it. He's like, the point is, uh, yeah, th- there's a historical claim to Jesus being a father. And T-Bing, he pipes up, bringing it back to the womb again. And he's like, yes, and his yes ending him. He's like, yes, and Mary Magdalene was the womb that carried his royal lineage. Stop referring to her as a womb. She was a person. And all this talk of wombs and, and female genitalia must have triggered something in Sophie because then she's flashing back on the ritual in the basement where she saw her granddad banging someone. And so she's distracted by that. She's like, oh, it all makes sense. So Teabing tells us that according to the Priory, Mary Magdalene was pregnant at the time of the crucifixion. So she fled the Holy Land and went to France and had a baby called Sarah. (laughs) I mean, you sort of lost me there. (laughs) Like I might've been on board for this big conspiracy, the church trying to use the Crusades to have a smear campaign against Mary Magdalene, sure. But then you lost me when, She just goes to France and has a kid called Sarah. (laughs) I mean, Sarah, (laughs) no offense to all the Sarahs out there, but I just wasn't expecting that. Heir to the throne, Sarah. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) 
<laughs> and Sophie's like, what? You know the kid's name? And this is when he's like, Adadoi. She's like the child of Jesus and Mary, who apparently is the descendant of some sort of Jewish king. So she's the pinpoint of two noble lines. Like, of course we know Sarah's name. She's the most important person in history. And that's when he says that there's a family tree. And so in the Sangreal, Sangreal, royal blood documents, you know, the documents, there's a family tree apparently. And someone's just with painstaking detail been tracking the family tree. And so Sophie has a good point. She just says, okay, but what good is like a family tree drawn on a bit of papyrus? It's not proof. Historians could not possibly confirm its authenticity. And T-Bing's just like, yeah, well, whatever. He says, no more than they confirm the authenticity of the Bible. And then he says something being like, history is written by the victors and, and never really answers the question. He just fobs her off with some rhetoric. And then he says, the Sangreal documents include tens of thousands of pages of information. Eyewitness accounts of the Sangreal treasure describe it as being carried in four enormous trunks, blah, blah, blah. I mean, does he know what's in there though? And he also says that they think that there's a book written by Jesus there. So apparently Jesus wrote a book. With what spare time did Jesus write a book about himself? Like, I'm sorry. By the time he was 33, he's already created his own religion where he's the figurehead. He's got the Romans pissed off at him. He's getting crucified. He's got these disciples at the last supper. He's washing people's feet. He's feeding fish to some wedding. He's walking on water. He's turning water into wine. He's performing miracles up and down the bloody coast. He's baptizing people. He's getting baptized. When did he have time to write a fucking book? No, no, no. I barely have time to do a fucking podcast. And here Jesus is starting a church and writing a book. I doubt it. I highly doubt it. And Sophie again calls T-Bing on this. She's like, really? Christ wrote something himself? And T-Bing's like, yeah, why wouldn't he? That's all he says. That's all he says. And that's his great argument. And she goes, yeah, good point. And so she says, so these four chests of documents, that's the treasure that was underneath Solomon's temple. Yes, bitch, it's been covered. And he says, yep, that's what's the purpose of the grail quest throughout history. Blah, blah, fucking blah, we know. But then she says, so if people are searching for documents, why is it called a search for the Holy Grail? And he says it's because the hiding place of the Holy Grail includes a sarcophagus. And so he says, the quest for the Holy Grail is literally the quest to kneel before the bones of Mary Magdalene. So it's her tomb. Her tomb is the Holy Grail. And yet, apparently the documents were taken around in in four giant chests. So are they, are those chests part of her tomb? Is she, is she buried in four different chests or are the chests being put into a giant sarcophagus? Or does one of the chests have the sarcophagus? Very unclear how that's all working, but it seems like Mary's dismembered into four different chests from my reading of it. And she says, so the Holy Grail is actually a tomb. And he says, yes, a tomb containing the body of Mary Magdalene and the documents that tell the story of her life. How how, how do those four chests fit into this? I I don't know. Maybe one's got a right leg, one's got a left leg, one's got the top half, one's got the head. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so... Yep, they're just talking shit about it again, just going over everything we've already talked about. Okay, so now he clarifies that it's not just about keeping the tomb secret. The Brotherhood, the Priory of Sion, the Knights Templar, whatever, they also have a duty to protect the bloodline. So they know who's the descendant of Christ and they're looking out for him, essentially. And that's the thing as well, like, why is Mary Magdalene the Holy Grail. Shouldn't Sarah be the Holy Grail? Because she's the the blood of both Mary and Jesus in one. Like Mary Magdalene hasn't got any of Jesus's blood in her. She's just the womb. So why is she the Grail? So they, they protected her body in this tomb spread out over four sarcophaguses, except Sarah, she's just been, you know, buried in a regular old cemetery, but she's Jesus's kid. Should she not be more important? Should she not be the sacred feminine? I don't know. Poor Sarah. Justice for Sarah. So he says Christ's line grew quietly undercover in France until making a bold move in the fifth century when it intermarried with the French royal blood and created a lineage known as the Merovingian bloodline. So it's five centuries of Jesus's little grandkids running around Paris. I mean, it's it's quite beautiful when you think about it like that. And he says that's one of the reasons why the Grail legend is so rich in France. (laughs) Yeah. All right, yeah. It's tied to the French royal bloodline. So many bloodlines. And so apparently Dagobert was a Merovingian king or whatever, and he was stabbed in the eye while sleeping. And she learned that at school, which seems a bit macabre. And he's like, yep, assassinated by the Vatican. 
and one of his descendants was Godefroy de Bouillon, who was the founder of the Priory of Sion. So then T. Bing says, the modern, because, you know, he loves to repeat himself, the modern Priory of Sion has a momentous duty. Theirs is a threefold charge. The Brotherhood must protect the Sangriel documents. They must protect the tomb of Mary Magdalene. And of course, they must nurture and protect the bloodline of Christ, which are those few members of the royal Merovingian bloodline who have survived into modern times. Let's just circle back to they must nurture and protect the bloodline of Christ. When he says nurture, does he mean like have kids with people? Like when he says nurture a bloodline, my mind goes to the priory are trying to knock people up to keep the line going, which is a bit creepy as well, isn't it? Okay. So then Sophie, because remember, she's very self-centered. Remember when her granddad died and she was like, oh, everything he's writing down on the Louvre floor are messages for me and me alone. She's very self-centered. So she's like, huh, wait a minute. Descendants of Jesus who survived into modern times. My grandfather wanted to tell me something about my family. He called me a princess. So she's automatically already thinking that she's the descendant. And I was like under the assumption that that was the twist at the end of the book, but she's already flagging it and foreshadowing it. So I guess it's not that big of a twist because she's that self-centered, even though she's ultimately correct. So then Remy, the manservant, <laughs> he's like, ah, uh, Mr. Teabing, um, so Lee, can I, can I talk to you for a second? And Lee's like, fuck off. Nah, I'm busy. I'm, I'm entertaining my guests. And he's like, no, seriously. Can I have a little chat in the kitchen? And he's like, no, Remy. And he's like, mate, I need to talk to you in the kitchen. And he's like, fine. So he goes off and has a chat with Remy. And that's the end of that chapter. Remember, because Remy saw the TV saying that Robert and Sophie were fugitives. Like, I don't know why he saw that four chapters ago and was sitting on a secret for so long. He's like, I'll let them have this big, long discussion and look at all the books and the artwork of Da Vinci. I'll let them get that exposition out of the way and then I'll bring it up with Lee. So yeah, Remy did them all a solid for the sake of getting a plot info dump out there. Um, So then chapter 61 opens up and she's like, Princess Sophie. She's like, I think I'm a princess. And she's looking at Langdon being like, am I a princess? And he automatically goes, no, Sophie. I thought the same thing, but nah. He says, Sonia is not a Merovingian name. And Sophie goes, oh, okay then. (laughs) So we're we're debunking things just on the premise that Sonia maybe didn't change a name perhaps. And we're just assuming that that for the bloodline to continue. After 15 centuries, they they all still have the same surname. I mean, people change names. People get married. People take a different name. People have bastards. Uh, he's like, no, nah, Sonia, no, nah, that's not Merovingian. Sonia, no, nah, you're not a descendant, Sophie. Debunked. Yeah, Sonia could have well and truly changed his last name, but no, I doubt he did. Sophie, you're not a princess. And she's like, okay. <laughs> Robert says, only two direct lines of Merovingians remain. Their family names are Plantard and St. Clair. And both families live in hiding, probably protected by the Priory. And yet you know everything. And if the Priory are really protecting them, maybe just change their names. Put them in witness protection. Like, uh, uh, they must be really bad at protecting these people if they can't even change the fucking names. That's crazy. And Sophie's like, hmm, there's no one in my family named Plantard or St. Clair. Oh, well. (laughs) And she says, Robert, I know Lee said that the Grail story is all around us, but tonight is the first time I've ever heard of any of this. And he's like, no, Sophie, you're wrong. (laughs) See, the way they talk to her is so rude. He says, no, Sophie, you've heard the story before. Everybody has. Well, she just told you she hadn't. So maybe listen to her and take her word as truth. And he says, nah, you've seen it. You just didn't realize you saw it. And she's like, what? And he says, the grail story, it's everywhere. And I mean, he does sort of have a point. Like, has the bitch ever watched Indiana Jones? Like, come on. Um, But he's like, it's everywhere. It's in the arts. It's in books. It's in songs. Da Vinci, Mozart, Victor Hugo, they all whisper of the quest to restore the banished sacred feminine. And here's where he's stretching, I think, because he's like, yeah, the hunchback of Notre Dame that's filled with Masonic symbolism and grail secrets. Is it? I don't really know. Is it? And he says, yep, even in cartoons, theme parks, and popular movies, they're all telling the story of the Holy Grail. And I'm like, okay, really, bitch? And he says, look, and he holds up his Mickey Mouse watch, you know, because he's an adult grown man and he's wearing a Mickey Mouse watch. He says, look, Walt Disney had made it his quiet life's work to pass on the grail story to future generations. I don't think he did. Like, I've got a Disney Plus subscription. I've watched the documentaries about Walt. 
And never once in all of those videos of Walt talking about his theme parks, he never said, by the way, my life's ambition is to get the story of the Holy Grail out there. No. And then it says throughout his entire life, Disney had been hailed as the modern day Leonardo da Vinci. And that's in quote marks, but we don't know who he's quoting because that's absolutely bullshit. Again, love Disney. No one's calling him the modern day Leonardo da Vinci. That's crazy town. Who is he quoting? Okay, so he says Disney loved infusing hidden messages and symbolism in his art. Yet maybe anti-Semitism, but I don't know about anything else. (laughs) But for for the trained symbologist, apparently, watching an early Disney movie was like being barraged by an avalanche of illusion and metaphor. (sighs) This is such a stretch, isn't it? Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, it all had to do with the incarceration of the sacred feminine. (sighs) Maybe in an abstract reading of it, yeah, but also it's three specific stories about women being dicked around. I don't know if that's exactly tied to the sacred feminine. And he says Snow White having a bite of an apple was a clear allusion to the downfall of Eve in the Garden of Eden. Okay, that might be the case, but what's it got to do with the Holy Grail? Jack all. And then he says Sleeping Beauty's Princess Aurora codenamed Rose. She's hidden deep in the forest to protect her from the clutches of the evil witch. And apparently that's the grail story packaged up for children. I mean, they're they're missing a few bits and pieces, don't you think? He says, Disney still had a savvy, playful element amongst its employees and their artists still amuse themselves by inserting hidden symbolism in Disney products. And then it says, Langton would never forget. (laughs) He'd never forget it. One of his students brought in a DVD of The Lion King and paused the film to reveal a freeze frame in which the word sex was clearly visible, spelled out by floating dust particles over Simba's head. I think that's since been debunked. I think it said SFX, like special effects. And it's no longer there. Like it didn't make its way into the DVD, I'm pretty sure. So Langton, I mean, grow up. Stop looking at sex in The Lion King. Like, maybe you're the problem. If you're seeing all of this shit everywhere, maybe that's on you and you're projecting, perhaps. And then it says, although Langdon suspected that this was more of a cartoonist's prank than any kind of enlightened allusion to pagan human sexuality. Uh, Yeah, uh, yeah. Even if there is sex spelled out in the sky dust in The Lion King, I don't think it's got to do with Mary Magdalene. And apparently... God, this is so stupid. When Langdon had first seen The Little Mermaid, he had actually gasped out loud when he noticed that there was a painting in Ariel's underwater home, which is actually a painting about Mary Magdalene. Okay, so that one I'll allow. But then he calls The Little Mermaid, of all films, a 90-minute collage of blatant symbolic references to the lost sanctity of Isis Eve, Pisces the fish goddess, and repeatedly Mary Magdalene. It's about a fucking mermaid. She's a fish with with a human torso. And it's about her giving up her voice and growing some legs so she can go and fuck a sailor. Like, I'm sorry, it's not about the Holy Grail or some fucking fish god. And then he says, of course, the little mermaid's flowing red hair was certainly no coincidence. Coincidence of what? She's got red hair just like Mary Magdalene and a lot of other fucking people. Like, no, I'm sorry. You can come for a lot of things. You can come for the Last Supper. You can come for the Hunchback of Notre Dame, but don't come for Little Mermaid and pretend that it's full of hidden secrets about the Holy Grail. Get fucked. So in the middle of all that, T-Bean comes back in after his chat with Remy the manservant and he's like, Robert, explain yourself. You've not been honest. End of chapter. And then we pick up chapter 62 and we're still in that scene. Usually we jump cut between different characters, but for the last three chapters in a row, we're just Robert, Robert, Robert which is a nice change of pace, but I don't know why it's spread over three chapters. Could have just been one big chapter. I don't know, Dan. Dan, 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 you're at it again. And so Robert, he's like, oh, Lee, I'm being framed. I didn't kill Sonia. And manservant Remy, he's like, shall I, shall I get them out of the house? Like, shall I show them out? It's like, no, if they're actually fugitives who you think have killed someone in the Louvre tonight, maybe don't just like escort them off the property. Maybe call the cops. And t like, allow me. And he opens up the door and he says, find your car and leave. Call the cops. And that's when Sophie's like, look, we know where the Priory Keystone is. And t like, how dare you throw that in my face? And Langdon's like, it's true. We, that's, that's why we're here. We've got the Keystone. And manservant's like, guys, leave or I'm going to call the authorities. Yeah, Remy, do it. And also all throughout this scene, we're not calling him Remy. Dan Brown's referring to him as the manservant. He has a name. Uh, but yeah, so then he's like, look, Lee, we know, we know where the cleft de is. 
And T-Bing's like, all right, all right, what do you know? And T-Bing tells Remy to go fuck himself. He says, go away, manservant. Let me talk about the Holy Grail and the Cleft de Voot with my guests, even though they've killed Sonia. And then we cut perspective and we're with Silas, who's just hanging outside, watching through the windows and apparently listening in. <laughs> and he can hear like every second word, but he, he is enough to be like, oh, they're talking about the Keystone. This is exactly what I'm here for. And so then we cut back to inside and Langdon's saying that the Grand Master was Jacques Sunier and T-Bing's like, oh, Polycock. He's like, what? No way. How could you possibly know that? And she's like, Jacques Sunier is my grandfather. And he's like, oh, uh-huh. He staggers back on his crutches. He's like fucking shocked by that. And you know, he's acting because he's behind all of this. So he's figured out who the center show and the grandmaster are and he's behind everything, but he's doing a great performance being like, I'm speechless, he says out loud. So you're not speechless. He says, Miss Nouveau, I am speechless. If this is true, I'm sorry for your loss, but also about that cleft of Oot, the keystone, where's that? Not super sympathetic to be like, oh, sorry for your loss, but wow. Let's get back to the Holy Grail mystery. And he says, it makes no sense. Even if your grandfather were the grandmaster and he created the keystone himself, he wouldn't tell you how to find it. I mean, like, please. The keystone reveals the pathway to the brotherhood's ultimate treasure. Granddaughter or not, you are not eligible to receive such knowledge, mainly because you're a woman. And even though the Holy Grail's all to do with protecting the sacred feminine, girls aren't allowed in the group. So obviously he wouldn't have told you so, if no offense. And my condolences, but no offense. And Langdon's like, he was dying. What else was he gonna do? And this is when Tabing's playing it up and he's like, yeah, but there's the center show. That's the beauty of their system. When one rises, they'll induct a new center shawl and share the secret of the keystone. And Sophie's like, oh, about that, they're dead too. And that's when Tabing, again, Oscar worthy, he's like, what? No. And he says, but how? A murderer could not possibly learn the identities of all four top members of the Priory of Sion. Wink. <laughs> And he says, look at me, I've been researching them for decades and I can't even name one of them, wink. He says, it seems inconceivable that all three and the Grandmaster could be discovered and killed in one day, wink. And then Sophie says, oh, I doubt all the information was gathered in one day, like that's crazy. It sounds like a decapiter, which is a technique we use to fight organized crime syndicates in the DCPJ. If the DCPJ wanna move on a certain group, we actually watch them for months. We stake them out and find out who their collaborators are. And then we pounce all at once and get them. And I'm like, bitch, you are a cryptographer. Why is she talking like she does this on the reg? She's like, yeah, we do it all the time. I thought she was just solving Sudoku's at work. I don't know what she does. I didn't realize she was that involved in the tactics of the DCPJ. And T-Bing's looking unconvinced. He says, but the brothers would never talk. They are sworn to secrecy, even in the face of death. And here we have a plot hole because reading this, we know T-Bing's behind it. And so if he believes that to be true, that the brothers would never talk, they're sworn to secrecy, even in the face of death, then why did you then go and kill them and interrogate them? Like, if you know that, then why was that your plan? And why did you kill them? So now when they did tell you a decoy story, you were fucked. I don't think you thought that through. But apparently you had thought that through because you're talking about it right now. I don't know. It's a plot hole. And so then Langdon's like, yeah, I know, but he was dying and he was worried that the location of the Keystone would be lost forever. So he left some clues for us at the Louvre and now we've got the Keystone, like obviously. And T-Bing's done a miraculous job here because he's really flipped it. And instead of them withholding information, they're like, believe us T-Bing and they're just offering up all the deets. So he's played them to perfection, really. As far as criminal masterminds go, you've done a good job because now he's got all the power and he's like, all right, well, prove it. (laughs) And he's also trying to throw the church under the bus and he's like, wow, it sounds like the church. And they're like, oh no, I don't know. And he's like, oh no, no, it really does. It sounds like the church is behind it. There's only one person possible who could be behind that and that's the Pope. And Robert and Sophie are skeptical and he's like, no, it's probably the church. (laughs) Just really trying to deflect that suspicion off of him and he's doing a great job. And Sophie says, well, it could be possible that these priory members were murdered by someone outside of the church, maybe. And T-Bing's like, nah, nah, it's the church. It's definitely the church. And Langton's like, but, but why would someone from the church murder priory members to find documents that they believe are false anyway? And T-Bing's like, oh, oh Robert, you idiot. He's like, of, of course they would do that. I mean, please. And they're like, okay, yeah, sure. Like he, he offers no counter argument, but somehow he convinces them. He says, I'll tell you what happens if the documents get out. The Vatican faces a crisis of faith unprecedented in its two millennia history. Yeah, I mean, 
they should be worried more about like pedophile priests and stuff. But yeah, this is what they'd be more concerned about. You're right. You're right. And Sophie's like, yeah, but like, why after all these years would the church do this? Like the priory and the Sangriel documents, they don't really pose an immediate threat to the church because they want to hide the documents. So they're poking all these holes in his theory, but again, he's winning them over with shitty logic. And he's like, well, actually, uh, the church and the priory have had an understanding for years. Okay, what? Apparently they've had like a little truce. And so the church were not going to attack the priory and the priory were going to keep the Sangriel documents hidden. How he knows this, not too sure. He seems to know everything. And he says, part of the priory history always included a plan to unveil the secret on the arrival of a specific date in history. What? How do you know this guy? I mean, this all sounds like bullshit. He says, yep, they were going to unveil the Sangriel documents at a certain point in time that may not have happened yet, but may also be coming soon. Who knows? And she's like, well, do you think the church knows that the date is coming up? Like what date? There's no date. And he's like, yeah, probably. And if assuming that the church was able to uncover the identities of the Priory members, then yeah, even if they don't have an exact date, their superstitions might be getting the best of them. How this is winning them over, I have no idea because it sounds like the biggest mumbo jumbo jive. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh yeah, because they're going to reveal it on a certain date that we do not know, but it might be coming up. So they're going to get rid of their truce that they've had, apparently. What? Wh- huh? What? And he says, in terms of prophecy, prophecy, we're talking about prophecy now. We are currently in an epoch of enormous change. The millennium has recently passed. Recently, again, that word. It's been years. It's been years. What was this? 2005, 2004, 2000? I don't know, but it's been years since the millennium has passed. And they're like now starting to think like, huh, maybe we should reveal the sunk real documents. And again, if that's true, why did Sonia go through with all of the cryptic clues on the floor and on the back of a painting with the key leading to a box? Why wouldn't have just written, hey, here's the answer on the floor and said, hey, Sophie, the key to the bank vault is here. Here's the account number. Here's the code. Here's the code for the box that it opens. Go at it. We were going to wait until an unspecified date and time, but now that I'm dying, go for it. But no, he doesn't. Ah, so apparently the 2000 year long astrological age of the Pisces, which is the fish, which is the sign of Jesus, uh, is, is ending. And then they're going into the age of Aquarius, the water bearer, which is man knowing the truth or some shit. So the ideological shift is enormous and it's occurring right now. So that's why they believe the Sangreal documents are, are soon to be getting revealed. Yet they weren't. This is all just teabing, bullshitting, trying to throw the church under the bus. And he says, yeah, the church calls this transitional period the end of days. And she's like, like the apocalypse. And, the, and Langdon's like, no fucking, no, Sophie, you idiot. That's a common misconception. God, they talk to her like a piece of shit. And he says, many religions speak of end of days, blah, blah, blah. But it's really referring to the end of the Pisces. What the hell? I didn't realize that astrological time periods went for 2000 years. Here I am working off of the horoscopes. Like oh, all I know is I'm a Scorpio. So are you telling me that people who are Pisces have just been having the best 2000 years of their lives and now, they're, now the Aquariuses, they're going to rise up? Are we in the age of the Aquarius? Oh, I don't know, but apparently the age of Aquarius has come, the end of days has arrived. And so many grail historians obviously put a lot of stock into this astrological mumbo jumbo. And so they believe it's the end of days. I don't know. I, I mean, it's, it's really not worth actually repeating. So let's just skip over it a little bit. So he's basically throwing the church under the bus. And that's when Sophie must be sick of it. She's like, okay, look, what are you going to tell me my horoscope enough? And she pulls out the key. She pulls out the key, not the box. Cause that's hidden underneath the couch. Why they brought it inside. I still don't know, but she's like, here's the key. And he goes, oh my goodness, that's got the Priory seal. What the hell? How'd you get this? The Priory seal, even though isn't the seal just like a flower or a fleur de lis or something. So it's like, they're everywhere, but okay. Yeah. He's like, whoa, whoa. How could anyone have something with the Priory seal on it? And she's like, yeah, my granddad gave it to me. And he's like, what's it a key to a church? And she's like, no, a bank vault. And he's like, what? A bank vault. And Langdon's like, yeah, a vault, a vault, like the Clef de Voot. He's like, you hear me? A vault, wink, wink. That's the clue. And I mean, yeah, it was technically in a vault, but it also came up on a crane uh, in a crate from a little robotic conveyor belt mechanism that reminded Langdon of baggage claims. So I wouldn't really call that a vault. And then Langdon's like, and also it came in a box 
that had a rose on it. So it was underneath the sign of the rose. You get me? And T-Bing's like, wow. Yeah, you found it. And he's like, well, we better get it out of the bank. And they're like, one step ahead of you, bud. It's underneath your couch. And then we cut to Silas still being a peeping Tom, just listening in. Apparently the wind picked up so we couldn't hear every word, but he's like, huh, the keystone's in there. That's handy. And apparently the teacher's words are fresh in his mind. And the teacher had said, enter Chateau Villette, take the keystone, but hurt no one. That's T being being like, don't hurt the kind, sexy old man with the braces and the crutches. Uh, Don't hurt him. He seems like a good guy. But yeah, just get the keystone, okay? So Silas sneaks in, he's got his gun out and he's sneaking down the hallway, just tracking them. And that's the end of that chapter. We go to chapter 63 for a little one with Lieutenant Colette, that loser. And he's standing at the foot of T-Bing's driveway and he's looking up at the chateau. And so then Fash calls him and he says, why didn't you tell me that we had a lead on Langdon? And he's like, yeah, I was just about to, I was just about to tell you actually, but you're on the phone. And so then he's saying that the estate belongs to a British national named T-Bing. Langdon drove a fair distance to get here and the vehicle is inside the security gate. There's no sign of forced entry. So chances are good that Langdon knows the occupant. And so Fash is like, okay, well don't arrest him. Wait for me to get there. I know I'll be 20 minutes, but I really want to make this arrest. And Colette's like, oh damn, I want to make the arrest. And he's like, no, you wait for me, buddy. And then he's like, fine. So then they get off the phone and Colette's like, why wouldn't he want me to just arrest him now? Like, why does he need to be the poster boy for this? And then he's like, oh, well, he did go out on a limb, putting Langdon out there and trying to get Langdon. So he probably wants to make the arrest, but also maybe he's having second thoughts that Langdon's the right person. Who knows? Cause he's like, why would Sophie try and protect the person that killed her granddad? That doesn't make any sense. So I guess it's common knowledge that she is his granddaughter now. I don't know. Anyway, so he's just thinking like, huh, it's been a weird night. Can't quite track it all. And then one of the field agents comes over and he's like, Lieutenant, we found a car. And he's like, oh my God, what? And so then they go and find a black Audi, which is what Silas arrived in. And Colette says, that must be how Langdon got here. Call the rental company, find out if it's stolen. Okay, what rental company? Call call the rental, how do they know there's a rental company involved? I don't know, but also, You just told Fash that you could see the car on the inside of the gate. So it's clearly not this car. So he's already said Langdon arrived in this car. And now he's like, oh, this car, that must be how Langdon got here. Would he not have gotten there from the car that you previously had sighted? Maybe he forgot that he's already seen a car. I don't know. (sighs) I don't know. So then they're looking through night vision goggles, scanning the place. And then up through the driveway in some shrouded bush, he sees the armored truck a third vehicle. And he assumes that must be the vehicle that Langdon arrived here in. So what was the car you were looking at before? If now you're thinking it's this armored truck and not this one from apparently a rental company. And so then he's looking at the truck and he's like, wait a minute, I've seen that truck before. That truck is identical to the one that I let leave the bank earlier. Isn't that crazy? What are the chances? And then he's like, oh, wait a minute. Oh no. And he says he prayed this was some kind of bizarre coincidence, but he knew it could not be. No, it isn't. And so then he's like, rot row, I never checked the cargo hold and I let them leave like whoopsie daisy. And now he's like, wait a minute, if they arrived in the truck from the bank, then who drove the rental Audi? And also who drove that other car that you were looking at perhaps earlier on in the book that just went plumb out of your memory. And so Colette's like, huh, this is a big situation. And then we cut to hundreds of miles to the South. Okay, it's just Bishop Aaron Garosa. (laughs) He's on the plane. And he's, he's air sick. Okay. So he's like vomiting in a little air sickness bag (laughs) and he's about to land in Paris. And he's just reflecting on the phone call that he had with Fash. And he's thinking everything in Paris has gone terribly wrong. And he's like, rot, row. And closing his eyes, Aaron Garossa said a prayer that Bezu Fash would have the means to fix it. And that's the end of that chapter. So I don't know why we needed to know that he was air sick. Like, I don't know why that got crammed in the end there, but it did. Okay. So, all right, it did. Um, well, that's it. I'm going to go and watch The Little Mermaid and try and find some of these little Easter eggs for the Holy Grail and Mary Magdalene. All right, I'll see you next week. Bye. Send your burning thoughts, frustrations and grievances on this latest chapter of this shitty book to breakingdownpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at podbreakingdown and Instagram at breakingdownbadbooks. 
You can visit www.breakingdownbadbooks.com for all the listen links, contact information, merch, and more. To support the show on Patreon and gain access to exclusive ad-free bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash breakingdownbadbooks. Ratings and reviews on your preferred podcast platform are also a fun, free way to support the show. Breaking Down Bad Books is hosted by me, Nathan Brown, who you can follow on Instagram and Twitter at NathanBrown90. Thanks for listening and happy reading.